Hello, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started shortly. I'm just giving everybody a second to join. Okay, if you have not done so already, if you could please introduce yourself here using your name and pronouns in the chat. Um, and also make sure to complete the check-in form, which you can either use the QR code on the screen or also using the link that Marjorie has sent out uh, during the presentation. Please just make sure to put comments or questions in the chat, or you can message Marjorie separately if you don't feel comfortable typing it out to everyone. And there will be time for questions at the end. So welcome to all of those who have not attended to uh, Epidemics of Injustice, Health Equity for Everybody. Um, we're really excited to have you here today. And just as a reminder, uh, you were muted upon entry, just to let you know, so we can mute you um, at the end when there are questions. And just to give you an overview, I'm one of the instructors of the course, and here are the other instructors and TAs. So for anyone who's joining us for the first time, um, just to give you some background, the class was created by Student Leadership in Radical Public Health, and it's now sponsored by the Collaboratory, where we're trying to bring community voices to the forefront across the School of Public Health. And you can find more information about the Collaboratory on the website. So uh, we just wanna review the community guidelines with you all. We ask that you please listen with an open mind, have mutual respect and appreciation for one another, respect the privacy and personal information shared in the space, allow everyone to participate, and any disruptive and disrespectful language will not be tolerated. We will, uh, it will result in the removal from the class session. And just as a note, we know that a lot of the content that we touch on can be really difficult to digest. So if you at any point find that this is difficult, uh, please step away if you need and take care of yourself during the presentation. The University of Illinois at Chicago stands on the original homelands of the Miami Three Fire Peoples, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Badwami, who have been stewards of this land for generations. Illinois is also home to a diverse Native community of more than 75,000 tribal members, many of whom live in the Chicago area. And for those who are not currently residing in the Chicago area, we do encourage you to look into the Indigenous people of your own lands. So I'm very excited today uh, to present to you all our guest speaker, India Hairston, uh, who has her MPH and community-based research program, um, and she works with Sister Love Incorporated. So this is very close home to home to me because it is an organization based in Atlanta, where I'm from, uh, and she manages Sister's Love Research Department and team. This includes various research studies and initiatives, a bilingual research coordinator, along with a host of graduate research assistants. She leads all of Sister Love's community-led research projects. Additionally, she works to ensure that all of Sister Love's research partnerships engage communities during each step of the research process. India received her bachelor's in psychology and inter interdisciplinary science from Virginia Commonwealth University and her master of public health specializing in behavioral social and health education sciences from Emory University Rollins School of Public Health. She's worked on various projects in the topic areas of maternal and child health, as well as sexual and reproductive health. Her main research lies in the areas of sexual and reproductive health rights and justice, more specifically on abortion access, STI HIV uh, prevention, PrEP uptake among Black women, and Black maternal mortality. Her passions include contributing, contributing to community-led research projects that transcend into community programs designed to improve overall health and well-being for Black families. Some of the projects she has led include community partnerships with Research Triangle Institute, RTI, recruitment efforts with IBIS Reproductive Health and Emory University, as well as a host of other nonprofit organizations. Additionally, she's presented research findings at national conferences with the hopes of educating academics and researchers on the importance of community-engaged and community-led research initiatives. She enjoys mentoring students and sharing her journey to public health, as well as personal experiences with hopes to inspire young Black women to join the field of community-engaged research. Outside of her work, she enjoys exploring new restaurants and coffee shops with friends and families. In India, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Wendy, I think you need to make her a co-host.
Can you unmute yourself now? Okay, perfect. Yes, I can now speak. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I first would like to thank Wendy for having me and for inviting me to this lovely session today. Um, and on a topic that is very near and dear to all of our hearts, and that is reproductive justice. So I want to thank you all for letting me be here and let me speak today. And I'm excited to really dive into this topic area. So next slide, please. So this is me. Um, hello once again. My name is India Harrison. I, I use she, her, and her pronouns. Wendy already did a great intro of me, and thank you for that. So like she said, I'm from a small town in Virginia called Hampton. It's on the Tidewater near Virginia Beach, if you're familiar with that area, with the Virginia area. I went to Virginia Commonwealth University, where I double majored in psychology and interdisciplinary sciences. We didn't have public health as a major during undergrad, so I had to kind of create my own program, and it worked out pretty well, if I say so myself. I then moved all the way down here to the South South, to Atlanta for grad school at Emory University at the Rollins School of Public Health. So here to the right side on the screen, I listed some of my work experiences, and this includes volunteer, internship, GRAs, and other work, exper work experiences. I think it's always really important to share your journey. Um, a lot of people that I've met have had very different journeys, um, in their public health careers, because you never know how this can help someone or motivate someone to keep going. As this is not an easy field to work in by any means, it's very tough. So if my story can help or provide some perspective, then that's my goal. So I first found my love for public health and public health research at the VCU Center on Health Disparities. There our research focused on preterm birth prevention among Black women in Richmond, Virginia, this was my first taste into public health work and community-based research. I also met one of my mentors there who really showed me what engaging communities really means. And I still model some of her methods to really get community members interested and motivated to really take their health into their own hands. I also worked with a couple of psychology-based labs. And at one time I thought I wanted to apply for psychology PhD programs, but I was too scared to enter into a PhD right after undergrad. I thought I would flunk out. And I'm so glad I didn't go that route um, as I ventured into public health. So while at Emory, I thought I wanted to move on from research into more program implementation and direct service work. So I worked at Community Advanced Practice Nurses, or CAPN for short, which is a free or reduced clinic, reduced fee clinic in Atlanta. And they did almost everything there that a typical doctor's office would, including free HIV and STI testing. But then I decided to dip back into research where I worked with the Center for Reproductive Health Research in the Southeast, or RISE for short, which is also part of Emory University. And there our research looked at abortion perspectives among clergy members and their congregants in Macon, Georgia. So you can imagine how that experience was. And it was really great actually, because it gave me the hands-on experience with qualitative research methods, including data collection and analysis. So before working with Sister Love, I, I got some more experience with direct services through my work with the, with the Fulton County WIC Department, as well as the Center for Black Women's Wellness. And both of these places offer services to women in the form of programs. I really wanted to see the full spectrum of services that were offered to women within Atlanta. Um, and I really got that from those experiences. So now I'm at Sister Love and I've been granted the opportunity to combine my passion really for reproductive health research with reproductive justice, along with sexual health rights and justice work as well. So as Min Wendy mentioned, I currently serve as the community-based research program manager. And my role there is to lead all the research activity within the organization, meaning all of Sister Love's research and all of our partnerships as well, and collaborations with other research-based agencies. Um, and there's now a team of four of us, and I'm so excited that we now have four members on our team who are working all within the realm of community-based research. Um, we were very fortunate to grow very quickly. At one time, it was just me, and so I managed the overall research team, and that includes all of our research um, from data collection to analysis to dissemination um, to presenting and things like this today. So that's enough about me. We'll move on to the next slide. All right, so before we jump into RJ, I'm interested to really know what you all already know about RJ. Um, so I kind of want to take a brief little poll if we could. Um, so you'll see on the screen, you know, what do we already know about RJ? So if you could type into the chat, just like the first few words, you know, that come to your mind when you hear the term reproductive justice. 
I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to like, you know, get the juices flowing a little bit. And I'm going to try to go to the chat and call out what I see. Okay, so I'm seeing equity, I'm seeing intersectional, definitely gonna touch on intersectionality in a couple minutes for sure. Options, choice, access, rights, access again. You all are moving at rapid speed, wow. This is amazing. Um, Non-negotiable, equitable, equitable support for choices around whether and how someone re reproduces, very nice. Control of women's bodies, Equal access to sexual health education, access to care. All right, these are all really great things that definitely also come to my mind when I also think of the term of RJ, Loretta Ross. All right, love that. Maternal mortality, maternal health, empowerment. These are all great things. The Black feminist movement, very nice as well. So thank you all. So it seems like we have a good sense, you know, thus far of what RJ is. Um, and we can move on to the next slide. Oh, they're still coming in. Systems-based, restoring agency in populations that have been historically and systemically oppressed. Very nice, very nice. So we can move on to the next slide. And I believe this is where we're gonna first watch a quick little video from the In Our Own Voices organization that gives us a quick little synopsis of RJ. So we can cue the video. Thank you. Reproductive justice. A lot of people talk about it, but many don't know what it really means. Here's the basic idea. Coined by 12 black women in June of 1994, the term is the combination of two phrases, reproductive rights and social justice. The new phrase reflected the lives and experiences of black women in the United States who had been denied a full range of services and protections. Black women have multiple identities, like age, ability, sexual orientation, immigration status, religion, and nationality, just to name a few. Consider the fact that black women experience some of the highest rates of poverty and only make 63 cents for every dollar a white man makes. Nearly 20% of black women have no health insurance and die four times as often as white women from pregnancy-related causes, regardless of income or educational status. The issue at play here is intersectionality, a term coined by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, which refers to how multiple systems of oppression work together. Reproductive justice is how we take on all the systems that harm us. Reproductive justice is the human right that can only be achieved when all women and girls have the complete economic, social, and political power and resources to make healthy decisions about our bodies, our families, and our communities in all areas of our lives. Reproductive justice centers the leadership and lived experiences of the most vulnerable, including but not limited to black women, women of color, LGBTQ people, and youth. So there you have it. Reproductive justice has given thousands of women a framework to change policy, improve services, collaborate with other social justice movements towards our collective liberation. For more information, contact In Our Own Voice at www.blackrj.org. Thanks for watching and welcome to the movement. All righty, thank you. And I hope you all enjoyed that little video as just a very brief intro into what RJ is. Um, so now we'll, we're gonna, before we do that, let's take a step back actually. I really um, want us to, I really want us to take a step back and define what is sexual and reproductive oppression. Because in order for there to be a need of justice, there must be some sort of oppression or injustice that exists. So the Asian Communities for Reproductive Justice defines reproductive oppression as the control and exploitation of women, girls, and individuals through our bodies, sexuality, labor, and reproduction. Now, as all of you are probably aware, there are many, many examples of reproductive oppression that we still see today. And some of them are listed here, such as incarcerating substance addicted mothers, 
forcing or co coercing use of dangerous contraceptives, family caps and welfare policies, the list goes on. Um, so you all can take a look here at some that I've listed, um, but there are many more. There are probably too many to name or to fit on a slide. Um, but I first wanted to define what this is before we really jump into what reproductive justice is. Next slide, please. So now let's think about the root of all this oppression. So what is the real problem? And it is really the battle of power. Through various systemic issues, such as white supremacy, structural racism, patriarchy, misogyny, as well as implicit biases, the impact of race on medicine and treatment among patients, imperialism, and of course, colonialism. These are really long-term issues that our country has dealt with for centuries and that we continue to deal with. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. I just wanted to acknowledge this. Um, as sure, I'm sure we're all very familiar and hopefully very aware. And when he told me you already had some discussions and conversations on this and on critical race theory. So that discussion has kind of already been had for me. So we'll move on um, to the next slide. So now that we have laid the groundwork, we can really focus on what reproductive justice is. I would first like to um, show a couple of graphics. Um, so here, the red one to the left is from Spark. This is an organization that we also work with. And the one from the right is from Sister Song, and we actually share a building with Sister Song. So we are both connected to these organizations. So why not, of course, showcase some of their work? So Spark defines RJ as a social justice movement, which is rooted in the belief that individuals and communities should have access, um, should have access, the resources, the power to make sustainable and liberatory decisions about their bodies, their genders, sexualities, and lives. So let's take that in for a moment. And then we have these various structures on each side of, this, of the hexagon that simply represent the oppression that we mentioned previously. The inside of the triangles, it shows the rights that RJ clearly defines, which should be accessible and obtained by anyone and everyone. So for example, we have the right to parent, to adopt. These were mentioned in the video. We have birthing rights, prenatal care, comprehensive sexual education. And these are a lot of the, the topic areas that Spark also focuses on through their work and through their advocacy. So the next image really displays the differences between reproductive rights and justice. Reproductive rights refers to the legalities of reproductive health care that someone is guaranteed through by various policies and legislations. The movement for reproductive rights was actually started by white middle-class women and there's a very narrow scope of what is included, and it really focuses on the freedom to control one's own reproductive health. It is also very individualistic, meaning that it applies to one woman's health as opposed to a group of women. And on the other hand, we have reproductive justice. And as you all just heard, it was started by um, women of color, specifically Black women. And there is an intersectional approach, which is really the basis of the framework. And we, will, we will touch on intersectionality in a quick moment, um, but it really focuses on the freedom to control one's own reproductive health. But it's also inclusive of one's parenting wishes, including how to parent. And because RJ is an approach that is inclusive of people from different races, ethnicities, genders, identities, et cetera, it really seeks to dismantle the barriers. And some of those barriers are ones that include the policies that reproductive rights tend to uphold. And lastly, it is social justice focused and approaches the work from a collectivist and structural perspective as opposed to the reproductive rights framework. So I hope that gives you all a good sense of the differences between the rights and justice movements. And we can go on to the next slide. Now I wanted to show this image as well as it shows all three together, right? It shows reproductive health, rights, and justice somewhat on a continuum. Um, and you see RJ here includes the fight for reproductive health, which is includes the individual services and social services as well. And also reproductive rights, which includes public policies, legal advocacy, um, and the laws that are upheld by our constitution. So it's important that we really have a basic understanding of the differences as well as what RJ really is so we can ensure that we are operating from the lens um, from this lens when speaking of overall women's health and the work that is still, it's still in progress and still being done as we speak today. Next slide, please. 
So for me, intersectionality really deserves its own, its own slide. So as you all heard in the video, the term was coined by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, who is world renowned. Um, and intersectionality, although it really can be, in my opinion, a whole course, just like RJ can be a whole course, um, it's really the, fr the framework that each person identifies with many identities sim simultaneously. And really the multiple aspects of our identities really intersect and influence each other to compound to create unique experiences for every person. So this term will always come up when one speaks of RJ and the movement. And it's also really used to describe, once again, that societal privilege and once again, that oppression that we speak on before. Next slide. So now that we know what RJ is and we're really on the same page, I wanted to open the floor up for just a couple of comments. Um, and I would love to hear how you all think that you can incorporate the RJ framework into your work. Um, so if you would like to speak, feel free to raise your hand. I think that's how we're gonna do this. Just raise your hand if you like wanna come off mute. Um, and then also some of you all may be already doing this work, right? You may already be incorporating the RJ framework into your research, into um, your practice or whatever it may be. So feel free to raise your hand or come off mute. I'm not sure if I will see that you guys or if the hosts will see that. You're able to, but we can also call on them for you. Thank yeah, you. that'd be great. Um, so yeah, don't be shy. Feel free to raise your hand um, and to provide some insight to your work. I know there are multiple people, people in the call who definitely work in this space of RJ, so I would love to hear from you all. I think you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, I can, I can jump in. Um, so I very briefly worked in the space of reproductive justice. Um, but I spent a summer working with a nonprofit um, that tried to increase access to menstrual hygiene care for women and girls in the urban slums of Mumbai, India. Um, and I think seeing how much societal stigma there was, especially in that community to even discuss this openly, I think a huge part of working in the space was empowering the women to even discuss this and to even recognize that it's a health need that they should address. Um, so a lot of it was just kind of building trust with the community we were working with and also giving them the confidence to, to voice their own health needs. And I think um, a big issue with reproductive health right now is it's not treated as important as other issues of health, unfortunately. So I think one huge part of it is creating that pedestal and that, um, that stool for people to speak on um, that empowers them to keep on um, advocating for their reproductive health needs. Um, I also think um, like health literacy has a huge part to play in reproductive justice. Um, so in, in order to actually increase access to healthcare, I think you really should increase access to health education um, along with that, alongside that. Um, so yeah, those are just my two cents. And I think that was, that went a long way in the project that I worked on abroad. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. Community engagement and community empowerment is a big part of RJ and in the work that we do as well. Um, so thank you for sharing your experiences. I think we had a chat. That's yeah. We also have something in the chat. I do trainings on LGBTQ health. And when we talk about reproductive health, we use an RJ lens. We try to talk about all the factors surrounding reproductive health, not just reproductive mm -hmm. rights. Mm -hmm. That's great as well. There are many factors that of course influence health and reproductive health as well. Um, so really speaking on all of them and really just allowing communities the opportunity to voice those concerns and those factors and ensuring that we are listening to them is super important as well. 
So thank you for sharing. I see two hands raised. David, do you want to go first? I think you were hand, you raised your hand first. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks. Following kind of like that last uh, vein, um, I was kind of surprised to see from this week's readings um, that reproductive justice doesn't just have to do with like pregnancy or birth or having a child, but it can also stem from these issues around like HIV, like what we read about, or just like, you know, a mother should have the opportunity to uh, raise a child like free from these disadvantages and that cause barriers for people. We talked about barriers earlier in this lecture. So I just think it was really cool to see. I think I think there's a lot of ways to tie in um, the RJ framework into our work. And I think because a lot of us are going to be either in healthcare or in like administration of healthcare. I think it's important that we kind of set the example for people. Um, and I think going back to what Ashwini said, I agree that health literacy and education is so critical. And she was kind of on the dot about that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, so yeah, I'm going to touch on some about the HIV work that our organization does, but you're completely correct. RJ is very inclusive to, you know, not just contraceptive, not just abortion, but almost anything when it comes to one's health care and one's overall health choices. So you'll see it can almost be applied to almost anything for sure. I think we'll take one more um, comment. Debo, I might be pronouncing your name wrong, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, um, so I haven't really done like RJ work, but um, my mom, I mean, growing up, I saw my mom do a lot of community work with reproductive systems in general. So um, I'm from Nigeria, so um, it's like early 2000s or something, they would like do come like walk to people's houses and talk to them about birth control about all of this stuff and then they something i found interesting was that my mom said they never really told the women that oh don't do this or do this they tell them different options so for example it's funny because we actually talked about this last month and i was like i think that's why i'm actually interested in public health because i just saw her do that so much um so they tell the women oh uh they'll be like oh you know don't have a kid next year just you know because you need time to take care of yourself but mostly they were really thinking about the women and like they don't want them to keep having children and not be able to work or take care of the children so instead of just saying don't have children because of this they tell them we're doing it because we want you to have more time to bond with your kid things like that so they, that's something i noticed that they didn't they tried to explain it to them in a way that they understood culturally instead of just saying this is why, you know, just forcing them to do something. So I think that was like really, really important. Um, they're just something important, something I noticed in their work. And it really helped. A lot of these women were using birth control more often. They were able to even tell their husbands in a very patriarchal society where people have to do what, you know, the man is saying, they found ways to make it work for all these women. So yeah, that's how, you know, and I think in the future, that's. A, finding ways to talk to patients or to people in a different way from what we're used to, from what the research will say, finding ways to just talk to them in a way that people understand. Yeah, that's super important as well. Definitely giving you know, women the choices, presenting all the options, that's super important. Um, and not just RJ work, but in you know, healthcare in general, right? No one should ever be forced or coerced into any type of um, care or any type of, you know, contraceptive methods that's completely, you know, just wrong and, you know, unjust. Um, so yeah, that's really important as well. Thank you for highlighting that. Thank you for highlighting um, your mom's experiences. So are we good on time, Wendy? Do we have time for answer more or read the chat or should I move on? So we have 20 minutes more and then we can get into Q&A. Okay. So yeah, I'll go ahead and move on then. Um, and I, I see you all's chats as well. We can definitely address those later on in the talk. So now I would like to, of course, tell you all about our organization who really embodies RJ and all of our work. So this is Sister Love. So for those of you that may not be familiar with our organization, we are a nonprofit community-based organization that is rooted in sexual and reproductive health rights and justice. India. 
So yes. I, I think something might be going on with the audio. Sorry to interrupt you. It's, Am I clear? Yeah, it's like cutting off a little bit. It's like a ro robotic type sound. Yeah, like a mic problem. Is this better? I don't know how to fix it. Oh no. Maybe, yeah, if you have headphones or if you, you can also, we can result to you calling in. I have headphones, one second. Okay, you mentioned, I worked on a project with individuals in a midwifery clinic at an FQHC where we looked at women's birth preferences, choices, medications, movement, location, associated freestanding birth center or hospital, and that was part of an overall systems redesign to mitigate unintentional institutional disparities. Um, RJ has come up with quite a bit in our 510 class, which is a maternal and child health, which is maternal and child health centered. We did an activity critiquing visual campaigns. It was really enlightening thinking about who we decide to de depict as being a birthing person or who we want to invite to engage with our materials, education resources involves being very intentional in how we plan outreach. And, um, oh, India, do you want to try your microphone? Yes, is this better? Oh yes, we can hear you. And then we can okay. get to the other ones when we get to that Q&A portion. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that guys, but thank you for the suggestion. Um, and I'm glad I had headphones right here on my desk. So that's perfect. Um, hmm, where was I? So yes, Sister Love is our organization and we were actually founded back in 1989 on the west side of Atlanta, Georgia. And we also now have an office in Johannesburg, South Africa. So our main areas of work are around health education and prevention or HEAP for short, policy and advocacy or PAP for short and community-based research. We also dive a little bit into um, some other exciting initiatives called innovative initiatives that fall under our One Love program. And we're gonna to touch on each of these topic areas or departments in a little bit. But on the slide here, you see that we have our mission statement, which is to eradicate the adverse impact of HIV, sexual and reproductive health rights and justice challenges that impact women and families through education, prevention, support, research, and human rights advocacy in the United States and around the world. So our vision is that we really fight for human dignity with equal protections and justice for black women in all of their diversities and for everyone that they love. So next slide, please. So let's take a deeper dive into each program area, first starting with health education and prevention. And this team, they go by HEAP for short. So Sister Love actually started with just the HEAP work. So here are our services listed we really have some great empowerment groups for women that live with HIV and AIDS. We don't really like the term support groups, so we use empowerment groups instead. We do a lot of prevention, education, testing, and counseling services, a lot of community outreach, typically in the form of you know, health fairs. Atlanta has a lot of really great festivals in spring and summer. So that's probably some of my favorite activities as well to really get involved with. And lastly, assistance with case management and some other community resources as well. So one thing to make clear though, that a lot of people get confused on is that we're not a clinic. So although we offer completely free of charge testing and screenings, we do not provide treatment. So we typically refer our clients that have positive results to some of our partner organizations that do have pharmacies um, and have a medical team on staff to provide treatment. And one of our long-term goals is to open a facility where we can offer more clinic-based services and definitely have a provider as well on staff for our clients. Next slide. So next we have our policy and advocacy team or PAP for short. Um, and I hope you all can read that tech hope is not too small. Um, and their work really entails with a lot of administrative advocacy work, movement building, coalition leadership and thought leadership. We have a team of great lawyers on staff who have really dedicated their work to help fight for justice on the policy side. Now, I am not a policy person at all. However, I really enjoy like reading their statements on our website as they really like know how to break down the various bills and legislation and laws so that a lay person can really understand and get involved. And next slide, please. So, this may be hard to read, and my apologies if it is. Um, so I wanted to highlight one of their most recent statements, and this is in regards to the Women's Health Protection Act. And this act basically protects the right to access abortion. 
Um, so you all probably keep up with the news and Georgia has been in the news a lot regarding a lot of um, abortion access bills and legislations. So if you visit our website and I highly recommend that you do, you'll see that our PAC team really does stay on top of all the new legislation to really ensure that our clients and all of our audience members are really well informed so that they can make educated decisions regarding their health um, and which bills and policies to support. Next slide, please. So next we have community-based research. Um, and here's a quote from the Carnegie Foundation, which defines community engagement as a collaboration between institutions of higher learning and their larger communities on various levels for the mutually beneficial exchange, that's the important part, of knowledge and resources and in context of partnership and of a context of partnership. So this is how we at Sister Love also define community-based research. The power no longer you know, lies within academic and for-profit institutions. It's now time that we really allow communities to do the research that is important to them and that's really essential to their overall well-being. So this is the program that I work with and that I lead. Um, so I'm really excited to show you all some of our work. So next slide, please. So besides our program though, there are many examples of action and HIV research that is all done through the RJ framework. So here's a list that um, just details some of them. So this includes the work of Black Mamas Matter Alliance, which is also um, in Atlanta, Georgia as well. Their work is Black women-centered research on maternal mortality. Um, there are many advances to include cis women in HIV prevention research in the form of PrEP clinical trials. Trans individuals are, have now been given their own domain within HIV prevention research. It's very exciting, as well as treatment trials. And other organizations such as IBIS, Reproductive Health, and the Coalition to Expand Contraceptive Access, or SICA for short, are also doing really great work centering contraceptive research among women of color. And our work marries a lot of these topics together. So we currently have projects that are examining the impact of HIV cure research, HIV prevention in the form of PrEP uptake, specifically among Black women, mental and substance use disorders among people living with HIV, also experiences of medication abortion among Black and Latinx women, and also some lived experiences around contraceptive use with women around the country. Next slide, please. Thank you. So here's a framework that I created for a recent grant proposal that I wanted to share with you all. Um, and I wanted to display the theories that really ground our research program. And it really all begins with Black feminist theory. So you all heard a little bit about that in the video. And if you're not too familiar, I really suggest you look into it. I actually took a class on Black feminist theory my senior year of undergrad. And it completely opened my eyes um, to the framework of not only RJ, but to also so many Black women scholars and authors that have been doing this work for a really long time. So the Georgia Access to Medication Abortion Project was one of Sister Love's first community-led research projects, um, completely led by Sister Love and completely funded um, through Emory University. So as I mentioned earlier, it seeks to really examine the thoughts, perspectives, and lived experiences of medication abortion among Black and Latinx women within Georgia, primarily the Metro Atlanta area. So the aspects of this project were, of course, the community that we church practices, the lived experiences among our participants, and as well as some members of the research team that actually led to the creation of this project. Storytelling, which is a huge component to qualitative research, and the various identities of the, of the participants and the research team. Also, of course, including justice, integration of services, and lastly, community engagement. We all recognize that this study really would not have been possible without the community's input. And we really utilize the community and with a mutually, a mutually beneficial manner to not only really complete the study, but to also educate on women's choices, including medication abortion. And so down at the bottom here, um, I listed, this is like I said, part of a grant proposal. So I, I listed um, some of the study outcomes for our community, um, the community members that would be a part of this study as well as the organization itself. So this just takes a look deeper into this project that we worked on as part of the research team. And so next slide. So yeah, that's about it for me. Um, and that wraps up my presentation. I wanna thank you all for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. 
Um, and also a big thank you to our founder, Dazon Dixon, Dixon Diallo, for her contributions, as well as to our whole sister love staff and family, um, and to the research team as well. I think some of them are in the audience as well. So yeah, I think we can now open it up for questions and discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, India. So I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to anyone who wants to ask a question verbally. If not, please feel free to chat us um, privately. And if not, then I also, we have some questions from the discussion post I can start with. So just give it a second to see if anybody wants to raise their hand. Okay. So the first question we have for you is, in your personal experience, what is the greatest barrier or challenge that stands in the way of achieving reproductive justice in the community today? Thank you, that's a good one. Um, the biggest barrier or obstacle, I would say it's just um, like people opening up to the idea, right, of the intersectional, intersectionality approach that I am not just a black woman. I present as a black woman, and that's what you see, but that is not, you know, all that I am. Um, so just getting other members of the community to really understand that, um, I would say is the biggest challenge because we we all come to this work, we all come to our places of employment, our friends, our, our friends, our family with different identities, and we showcase them all at one time. So I'm presenting my whole self to you. Um, so I would say that is probably the biggest obstacle, but this work is still being done. It's still being done every day by lots of great people that are doing the work. So we are getting somewhere and definitely much progress has been made over the years. Um, but that's a good question. It's hard to really pinpoint you know, the one obstacle, but I would say that one. Thank you. Um, we'll let anyone who wants to raise their hand. So the next question I have for you is what policies has Sister Love helped pass? What policies are Sister Love's, is Sister Love currently working on? That's a great question. Um, I'm definitely not a policy person and I don't wanna say the wrong thing um, or misstate, um, but we definitely are in coalitions with a lot of other RJ orgs that are helping to pass um, some of the policies within Georgia one that, I, one that I do know that we did help to stop was the abortion ban, but that happened like about a year or so ago um, when Georgia went through that. We, along with a lot of organizations, um, lobbied um, at the state capitol to help stop that. But there are many that our policy team works on every day, um, statements that they write. So I definitely encourage you all to look at our website, sisterlove.org, to really um, get your own view of what policies that they are working on and which ones they are helping to lobby either against or for. But a lot of, you know, for lack of better, a lot of crazy stuff is happening in Georgia right now. So they're definitely on top of that and trying to prevent some of those things. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Katie. I'm a medical student, uh, first year at UIC. And I was wondering if Sister Love or any of your partner organizations have done any work with um, the medical schools in the Atlanta area around ensuring that students are given appropriate education around reproductive justice and reproductive health, um, especially as it relates to caring for future patient populations, how that's gone. Great question. Um, and we have. So Sister Love has been along for a while. We have great ties with some of our, with some local universities such as Emory, Morehouse, Spelman. Um, our founder, actually, if I'm not mistaken, um, was actually a professor at Morehouse for a while. So we do, most of our interactions are with public health students, um, as that's probably just the easiest entry point into the conversation around RJ, um, like just like how I'm here today. But we definitely are looking and would be open to having more conversations with, with more medical students, as I really think it is important to shape the conversation, especially when it comes to patient care and patient communications that you all will be having, you know, in the future, um, and really trying to apply that RJ lens to your work as well. Um, but yeah, we definitely have some 
partnerships already with a lot of universities. A lot of our interns, our GRAs come from a lot of the neighboring schools. So I, I love having students. I love talking to students because um, it's, it's helpful to get their perspective, you know, and what comes from the textbook, but also what comes from lived experiences and experiences around our work as well. It's a great segue to your next question. Um, let me give you some background so then I can pose the question. Um, but in terms of, it's from a student. I do research in the NICU where I speak to mothers of premature babies to give them a space to open up about their and their child their childcare experience. And I found that there are far more BPOC than white premature babies. Not only that, but the BPOC moms often express feeling unheard or dismissed by the healthcare professionals in the department further emphasizing the presence of a disparity. I feel that I have a slight privilege as a medical student as I can freely express my opinion and critique the hospital system without being worried of my attendance displeasure, a luxury that I would likely not have as a resident or a fellow. The step power dynamic is an issue in of itself. How can I use my platform as a medical student to better advocate for patients who experience disparities in maternal and child health outcomes? And I will put that last part in the chat. <laughs> No, that's a good one. Um, and thank you for, for to that person for giving the background and context. Um, so as a medical student, I think you still have space. You know, you have space to critique, you have space to ask questions. And with your patient interaction, you have space to be there for that patient. So for that mom, you have space to listen to their concerns um, and relay messages possibly to the doctor um, that's working on that mother or that newborn. So you have, you have opportunities, I think, to have your voice heard. I wouldn't be, you know, timid or scared. It really takes pushing the envelope and a lot of, for a lot of us um, to make change or to even start change, you know? So I would say to be, to be vocal, to express your concerns but then also while you're expressing them, making, making sure to listen um, and making sure that the patient knows that she is being heard at all times. So maybe when she is expressing, um, expressing areas of pain or areas of confusion or wanting more clarity on something, making sure that you're listening and then relaying what you can back to the other providers that will, um, that will be caring for her and caring for her newborn. I hope that makes sense. But just overall, you have opportunities to do to do something. I think it's always better to do something than to sit back and do nothing. Thank you. Um, the next question I have for you is from the chat. Do you have any ideas about how we can make reproductive justice efforts gender inclusive? Women are often thought of first based on discussions I've had in the classroom and in work settings. Was that from the check? I thought I saw that one earlier. I think so. But I can put it in here again. It was just how to make um, RJ more gender inclusive? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the initial framework of RJ is very gender inclusive. Um, I think just over time, like anything, it can get portrayed in various lights and various ways, but from what I've read and from what I've studied, the RJ framework is very gender inclusive to women and all of their gender identities, including trans women, cis women, cisgender women as well. So women are often thought of first based on discussions. So maybe so, your, is your question geared toward men within RJ? Yeah, does a person who I, I know I don't I you probably wrote this right wanting to have that anonymity but if you want to come off mute and explain a little bit more I'm not sure if you're touching on language and being inclusive in, in terms of for example how we instead of saying like pregnant women we now refer the, to pregnant people is that kind of what you're leaning towards uh, language use mm -hmm. right yes oh. Oh, she said not her question. But I think I can touch on that a little bit. Um, yes, like non-binary. So a lot of language has been, um, a lot of languages now that's now used that I'm now more familiar with is around like birthing persons, for example, or birthing individuals. So that is a way to make 
the RJ work and the reproductive health work more inclusive because we do we we do now know that not everyone that um that is birthing does consider themselves um or does identify as a woman. Um, so I think there are some efforts by a lot of great great organizations that are now doing some of this work that are trying to be more gender inclusive. I hope that helps. Yeah, and to whoever asked that, if you want to chat me privately to kind of expand on what, if we got to what you were um, trying to ask, let me know. Um, the next question I have for you is how was sister love affected by the illegal sterilizations that took place in the ICE detention centers in Atlanta? What resources are you able to provide for immigrant women being detained in situations as this one? That's a great question. So we definitely were affected by those sterilizations and um, the various situations that happened within ICE. I do know that a lot of our workers and a lot of our staff members were very involved with providing resources to women. So definitely providing um, the testing that we all have always done, free HIV and STI testing, but also just being there as a supportive or an empowerment service. So I am not exactly sure what we did directly, but I know we always have had our doors open to anyone and everyone that comes through that may be in need of support or services. We've had women come to our doors for almost anything and everything that is sometimes out of our realm or out of our area of scope. So we definitely utilize our partnerships and our resources and other organizations to find those women the best help that we can and the best assistance, even if it's not coming directly from our offices. And the next question I have for you is, in light of the alarming rates of Black maternal mortality rates in the U.S., how would an intervention method be presented or implemented by an organization like Sister Love? Also, has Sister Love done any work with doulas in terms of community engagement to address Black maternal mortality rates and infant mortality rates as well? So it's a two for one. Mm -hmm. Great question. So Black maternal health and maternal mortality um, is an area that we are getting more into. Um, and I just say that for lack of better phrasing at the moment. So Sister Love typically and historically has really been focused on sexual and reproductive health. But a lot of the work that I'm doing currently is in collaboration with a lot of maternal and child health organizations. So for example, Black Mamas Matter Alliance, I currently serve on one of their research studies looking at safer child cities, safer childbirth cities initiative. So we're currently doing a lot of work and in a lot of conversations with other organizations that are doing some work around Black maternal health, um, Black maternal mortality, as well as infant mortality as well. And we do actually do some work with doulas as well. Um, so we're looking to partner more with doula organizations. But within this collaboration with, with BMMA, we're doing a lot of work with doulas and midwives as well. An intervention method, that's a great question. Um, so typically our interventions um, or our programs that we, that we like to call them. So we have an evidence-based intervention that was um, approved by CDC, which is called the Healthy Love Party. So we like to introduce our work and our topics in a very non-intervention non way, actually, typically in the form of parties or gatherings so that we can break down some of those barriers of stigma um, to really... It really influenced conversation um, and to highlight the various, the various realms of sexual health, pleasure, autonomy, and all of those things. So an intervention really to look at Black mortality, Black maternal mortality rates would probably be something very similar to that, talking to Black women about their experiences, seeing how we can be of service, how our partner organizations can be of service as well. But on the flip side of that, I think it's also super important to talk to providers as well. So uh, many of you all who are medical students or MPH students that will, you know, be within healthcare in the future, having those conversations at early on as well to really cut down on those biases, on those perceptions, um, and to really just have more conversations around that. So that's how I would, you know, probably model an intervention like that. And I'm going to go ahead and open it up to see if anybody wants to ask a question out loud. If not, we can go to the last one. 
on the chat. Okay, so um, one of our previous sessions was on fat liberation related to that. How does sister love support fat pregnant persons or how does RJ in general incorporate principles of fat liberation? And that's a great one. Uh, Wendy previous, previously told me that you all definitely had that discussion on fat, fat liberation, which is really amazing. So I'm not too familiar within the RJ framework. Um, I haven't done that much research and that much reading, but I know that RJ in general supports anyone and everyone. And if someone identifies as being a fat person, then RJ, you know, is for them. And RJ um, completely supports them in all of their choices and all of their autonomy. So Sister Love also, of course, supports everyone, um, fat, pregnant persons. Um, we do not discriminate in any of our services or any of our efforts to bring communities together to do this work. So there, there's not much, you know, program that we have right now that are geared toward um, fat pregnant persons, but all of our work encompasses all women um, and, and all their gender identities and all the people in their family and, and, and those that they love as well. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so I will just let anyone who wants to come off mute, come off mute if you want to. And I think if not, then that's really, that's all of the questions. I hope I didn't miss anything in the chat. I might have. Um, but I think that's it then. Well, India, thank you so much. Um, for everyone who is joining us, for um, who's in the class enrolled, India is going to be joining us for the second session to also do an action lab with us. Just want to thank you for your time and your lecture, and um, we'll see you all next week. And for the students, we'll see you in the other group. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you.